Encrypted Classic Horror with Jasper Lestrange. Tales of horror, mystery, and suspense. <laughs> It all began, said Francis Winthrop, when I was led by my husband excitedly over three and a half miles of wet moor to inspect the old farm he had recently discovered. It was not only the fact that it was incredibly lonely, was at least two hundred years old, and probably possessed, as he explained with enthusiasm, Lord knew what queer history. But it was, though dilapidated to a degree, occupied by an old scrag of a woman whom he declared gave him the shivers. Beyond demurring mildly that neither could possibly interest me to the extent it did himself, I consented to tramp along to see the farmhouse and its grim-sounding occupant. I had discovered long ago in the early days of my marriage that it was not everything to be the wife of a popular playwright. One, moreover, who specialised in those of a sensational character and was consequently ever on the lookout for likely material. I realised that for some months now his pen had been idle, that possibly through overwork or lack of change, no themes had come to his harassed brain except those which had been used countless times before. Here, in the old farm, he had found the necessary impetus. He declared the very look of the place inspired him, that if he could only obtain admission, he was sure he would find his plot already made within its four walls. Further, so better to soak in its atmosphere, he suggested that we occupied the place ourselves until such time as the play was written, providing, of course, the old woman now living there was agreeable. There was a village of a sort half a mile away, and probably she would be only too glad to move there, he said, unless, as an alternative, she agreed to stay and do for us while letting us have a room or two for a consideration. I was against it from the first, but seeing him so eager and hopeful, and dreading a continuance of his moody irritability, the restless pacing and sleepless nights while he vainly pursued the elusive idea, I forbore to mention how much I disliked the project. For myself I foresaw many hours of loneliness and boredom. One afternoon in late September, then, we set off. Not from my point of view, what one might call a promising beginning. Oliver strode on rapidly, impatient to be there, scarcely noticing how I stumbled over the heathery ground. At length, after what seemed hours, we climbed a rise of the moor where beyond, in a shallow basin of desolate land, showed the shale roof of a building, its lines half obliterated in the failing light. Is that the place? I asked, my heart sinking inexplicably. Oliver ran down the curve and stopped before a broken down gate covered with lichen. Out of the shadows the farm arose in a chaos of neglect and decay. Hideous fungus was growing everywhere between the chinks of the cobblestones on the rotten and broken fences. Even the walls of the farmhouse itself were smeared with curious green vegetation while the rock moss flourished on its roof. Trunks of old apple trees in an orchard beyond were grey with lichen, and twisted by age into fantastic shapes. In the moor twilight which was creeping up cold and cheerless, with strange ominous streaks of colour where the sun had gone down, it was a dreary, desolate place. I drew back, an indefinable fear possessed me. I won't go in, I said, in a rather shaking voice. Rubbish, Francis, why on earth not? demanded my husband. He climbed determinedly over a tumbled down wall and stood in what had once been the farmyard, now a rat infested wilderness. A pool to one side was green with slime, and sodden straw lay littered about in heaps. The farmhouse, a low, squat building whose ancient roof sagged and humped crazily in a last effort to avoid slipping off bodily, with its close-shut door and secretive-looking window, appeared dead and deserted amid its army of strange and hideous weeds. I could see, as Oliver stood staring, that he was frankly revelling in it all, in its possibilities for the production of a real thriller. And indeed, what with its dismal and forsaken appearance, 
its air of sinister and brooding and quiet, its very situation, hidden away there in the fastnesses of the moor, with only the owls and the conies for any signs of life. Even I, who am no dramatist, could understand the attraction it held for Oliver. Meanwhile, I stood beside him, protest in every line of my body. A chilly wind sighed and whispered about our ears, and stirred the few stunted bushes growing against the crumbling walls. It was unbelievably lonely. There's that old Harridan who's living in the place at present. What about knocking her up and getting her to show us over tonight? Oliver proposed enthusiastically. It was with I knew a mental picture of the posters outside a well-known London theatre announcing Oliver Winthrop's new success that he raised his hand and knocked loudly on the door, set so deep in a porch as to be almost invisible in the growing darkness. The echo died away in a series of muffled responses. We waited, and five minutes passed away. Ten, and still no one came. Then, just as Oliver was going away disappointed, the door silently opened the width of an inch or two. Someone made a mumbling inquiry as to what we wanted. Oliver asked, might he and his wife step in and rest for a moment, as both were tired with walking over the moors. There was no reply, but a face, white and curiously vacant, appeared around the narrow opening and peered closely into ours. Apparently satisfied with what it saw there, the door was opened a fraction wider, and we were motioned to come in. We bent our heads low and entered a dark flagged passage, then into another door which led into a black raftered kitchen, dimly illuminated by the waning daylight that came in through a window, covered with dirt and cobwebs. Two chairs were pushed out ungraciously. We seated ourselves. I looked around uneasily with a creeping aversion. The misshapen old creature who lived there was surely the most silent thing I had ever seen and also the most repulsive. So bloodless, so emaciated was her face, with one shoulder held higher than the other, so that her body was awry, and her gait a twisted, seesawing motion. There was something supernatural about her, something quasi-human that went with the brooding house, the lonely moor, and the night winds that swept blackly about it. She stood with a pallid watchfulness, silently waiting for us to speak. Do you not find life here very lonely? I observed at length, unable to bear longer the heavy silence, the shadowy room, and the odour of damp and decay that hung clamorly about it. Her voice, a thin, bodiless whisper, replied she was never lonesome. She was one that preferred her own company. You live here, then? Quite alone, said my husband, rising as he spoke, to put a match to the old-fashioned lamp that stood on the table, having received a nodded permission. Eh? It's quite alone, except for my thoughts, and my girl old black cat. She gave him a strange, unfathomable look from her sightless-looking eyes, and as she moved, so the figure of the cat, sitting motionless in the gloom behind her, came into view, its eyes glittering greenly, their shadows grotesquely outlined against the wall, on a sudden rose up till they touched and spread along the ceiling, and appeared to crouch menacingly over our heads. Nervously I averted my gaze, but found it riveted instead on the face of the attenuated old creature standing opposite us. It was with a shock that I really saw that countenance for the first time, so fleshless the bone showed beneath its covering of skin, an expression both fixed and mask-like, a wide and lipless mouth, no eyebrows, eyes sunken in discoloured sockets, a nose with the left nostril black and closed, and one or two crooked and pointed teeth. A tremor of repugnance shook me from head to foot. She was horrible, unnatural, it took all my willpower not to rise from my seat and run from the house, there and then. Might I inquire why the farmhouse has been allowed to fall into its present neglected condition, which obviously is a matter of some time, Oliver inquired at this point. Eh? 
mumbled the old hag vaguely, as if she were a little hard of hearing. Her speech, a sequence of inarticulate sounds, was faint and difficult to understand. Eh, that power years ago it were proper fine farm, but they do say as how it were a scene of terrible deeds. Now neither man nor may will come an eye and after the dimps, and if it weren't for me, nobody is living in. An eerie sound moved in her throat, which faintly resembled a chuckle, an amusement not shared by Oliver and myself. It was a sound that seemed full of hidden meaning, and sent a cold shiver down my spine. Which is pain they call us to farm round these here parts, or maybe tis wolf's pain. I just remember now, on account of they weeds I are hidden. She gibbered with a silent person's garrulity. But for certain, sure, then more will have feared to come down along because of Thicky. But come long up over, and then I'll show ye. There was something almost frightful in her smooth, noiseless movements as she twisted from side to side in ceaseless contortion. So unsubstantial was she, she seemed merely the envelope that covered a thing of skin and bones. She led us upstairs first, up a rickety staircase, impossibly steep and damp, and into several empty bedrooms, all with low and sloping ceilings crossed by heavy black beams, and with the tiniest of windows that had the appearance of being sealed, so long unopened did they look. The floors too had a downward tilt, and sagged as one stepped upon them, with our shadows now weirdly elongated to an exaggerated height and now dwindling down to nothing as we wandered through the musty-smelling house. The eerie old woman, like a distorted shadow herself. It was daunting to a disagree. I followed, shrinkingly, with a fear nonetheless real for being non-susceptible to definition. I could see, however, that it would be useless to appeal to Oliver. By the excited way his eyes shone, he was resolved more than ever to put his crazy plan into execution. To imagine living in this ghostly place even for a day filled me with horror. Down the stairs we creaked again, and into what once had been the farmhouse parlour, a room rather long and low. The smell of damp and mouldiness which pervaded it was made more apparent by the wooden window shutters that were tightly shut on the outside. The ceiling, bisected by heavy oak beams, was discoloured and dropping off in places with mildew, while ancient paper hung and rotted from the walls. There was a broad window seat, with low, wide windows, which when opened gave on to a stretch of moorland, extending as far as the eye could reach. And there, on the sill, grinning at me, was... I started back all at once, uttering a startled exclamation. It was an object so unexpected to see there, and yet so in keeping with this room, with this strange house that lodged it. I rubbed my hands, the slim white fingers that had touched it, with fastidious distaste. I have ever hated touching anything that is not fresh and sweet and clean. Not that this thing on the window sill was not clean. It was as clean as age and decay could make it, yellow and smooth. It shone almost as if polished with oil, a broken, weather-beaten skull. Extremely old, it was certainly human, the forehead being very low and badly proportioned. <laughs> Earth's nothing to be afeard of. Now? Again, that unpleasant sound agitated the ancient creature's throat. Aye, but a famous witch she were. There's folks what do mind even now how pigs and cattle died quick and mysterious like. If her were offended and no amount of salt round the styes and barns would avert it neither. Oliver pricked up his ears. I too listened with a half-willing, half-fascinated interest. This story of witchcraft of a less matter-of-fact age was strangely compelling. The odious old creature appeared to delight in it, liked to dwell on all things that were ghoulish and horrible. The influence of the evil eye the propitiating of the powers of darkness, and so forth. Eh, 
Malirai were her name, and her were done to death, drowned in alive or summit, in the days of King George. But arter her were dead, her wouldn't remain quiet. The most scarifying groans and screeches was heard. Her died cursing anyone what should bury in, and sworn that if any weren't kept within the walls of the house where her had lived in life, her spirit should make it uninhabitable like for human beings. While in course of time her weird away and only the skull were left. But mindy, she went on with a kind of eldritch enjoyment. But mindy, it must never be disturbed. For if tes, terrible sounds are said to be heard and accidents, storms, Fires and calamities followed as naturally as sun arter rain. There were some new tenants here too once. They buried in for three days. And here it has remained, as Tez liked to do, for several more centuries. Delighted with this macabre recital, and more excited over his discovery of the old farm than ever, Oliver now eagerly voiced the plan he had had in view from the moment we entered the place the ghastly old creature proving more amenable than he had hoped for, possibly the amount of the sum he offered having something to do with it. Arrangements for our occupying one or two rooms were very soon completed, with satisfaction on all sides but mine. This suggested staying at the farm was a thing I dreaded beyond words. Something outside myself warned me that it was the direst folly we were contemplating. It is madness. Nothing but disaster will come of it, I told Oliver, with the conviction of a presentiment. He, however, merely reiterated his belief that here in the old farm lay the nucleus of one of the best thrillers he had yet done, that he had an idea already even, and was all impatience to be settled in, and the play begun. As the broken and lichen-grown gate closed behind us once more and we started on our homeward tramp over the now dark moors, something made me look back. The rain had ceased, and in the light of the yellow half-moon I saw the wizened figure of the old woman, the cat beside her, standing in the doorway, looking after us, an evil and peculiarly malign grin twisting her lipless mouth. At first, the presence of the skull on the windowsill did not trouble me to the extent I had feared, for after all, what harm could an old broken skull do anyone? To be sure, it was not particularly pleasant, but since it was the custom, I endeavoured to conquer my nervous fears of it. Oliver, busily at work behind a closed door and surrounded by sheets of manuscript, was absorbed and abstracted. However, from his look of satisfaction, I knew the play was shaping well. Judging from its title, The Death-Dealing Skull, it promised to be all that the lovers of thrills desired. I was almost as much startled as relieved to discover no presence of Anne Skegg, that strange personality, anywhere about. The house was left entirely to ourselves. It occurred to me that possibly she had thought better of her original intention, and had, after all, repaired to the village, if such it could be termed, until we should have departed, and her home once more be left to its former undisturbed quiet and solitude. I did indeed make a tentative inquiry from one or two of the cottagers there, but I was stared at so queerly with such startled attention that I didn't pursue the subject further, beyond eliciting the information that Witch's Bane Farm hadn't been lived in for years as far as any of them knew, and that the last tenant had committed suicide, and that neither love nor money would induce any of them to put so much as their noses inside it. I returned, on the whole, rather more perplexed than before. Came russet October, the bare moorlands, sprent with gold and purple, bloomed anew under the spell of air crisped with the first frosts. I walked for miles each day, delighting in the exercise and the new-born beauty around me. However, the days passed, and November brought with it chill, sobbing rain and empty hours. Now I was confined to the house and the doors were shut to the wind's will, the open sunshiny air, and the blessed freedom of the moors. Dank and miserable they stretched before the farm in an endless pool-sodden waste, 
how dark it was now in the house always. Even what little sun there was had no entrance, and the owls, always the owls to haunt me with a mournful crying. Immersed in his work, Oliver noticed nothing of this, did not notice how slowly and imperceptibly as I passed hour upon lonely hour in the musty smelling parlour, the sight of the skull lying there in its accustomed place began to be more than I could stand, so that I could view it only with a sense of rather absurd horror. How its eye holes, inky and horrible, bored into my own, its mouth grim and awry, the broken, irregular teeth, the low, criminal-looking forehead. I both feared and loathed it. Always it appeared to grin evilly and maliciously at me, as though at some obscene jest. A night came that had set in early. I was alone as if no one were in the house, so silent was the room, the farm. Outside the wind pressed against the windows. An old tree in the yard adjoining creaked and groaned with a straining of leafless boughs, and tapped on the black panes with phantom fingers. The old parlour, seeming dingier and even more gloomy, was a place of shadows. The only light was that cast dimly by a hurricane lamp, beyond its narrow circle into the dark corners of the room. I dared not look lest nameless things should stir and leap upon me. I trembled at every creak, awaiting with a dreadful anticipation for the very door to open silently towards me and disclose who knew what shocking spectacle. And when the long-drawn-out hoot of an owl echoed in a tree outside, I sprang to my feet, shuddering violently. In the jumping flame of the lamp, a shaft of light danced now here, now there, over the gruesome skull, lighting up the eye holes and heightening the effect of sinister and sardonic amusement. I must have partially lost control of myself, or at least of my better judgment. Before I quite realised what I was doing, despite its alarming reputation for resenting either its removal or any indignity done to it, I had seized the loathsome thing quickly and thrust it out of sight in a dark cupboard. That night, Oliver and I were awakened by a sound of weird, unearthly screaming, droned on and on, low, unceasing and maddeningly monotonous. There was something terrible, something mysteriously awful in the sound, as if dead hopes and utter despair were being voiced, as if numberless souls in torment were circling in the black air above the farm, and were wailing and crying their anguish through the keyholes. I listened, quailing in my bed, not daring to confess what I had done. Oliver declared it was wind, for such a storm was ranging of wind and thunder as set all the doors banging and the windows rattling. Sleep was made impossible, a little towards dawn. Secretly, I restored the skull to its place. Anne Skegg, whom, strangely and unexpectedly, I encountered in one of the flagged passages, gave me a look from which I fled. There was such malevolent amusement in it. Now, from this time, Anne Skegg never left the house. It was as though she mistrusted me, as if she feared for the safety of the skull, and constituted herself its guardian. She appeared even more vague, more attenuated than before, and even more silent. A subtle difference in her both perplexed and intimidated me. Her jaw was never still. Her whole person shook from either old age or extreme cold, and at the front of her gown, of an outmoded fashion with which I was familiar and yet could not place, extended a curious green stain. The mere sight of that twisted, contorted figure, with its sideways dipping walk, its long, lanky hands, creeping, drifting, rather, about the passages and up the stairs, sent a shuddering dread through every nerve of my body. At this time, so great was the peculiar revulsion she inspired in me. In an effort to avoid her, I tramped for miles over the soaked and desolate moors. I began to entertain the most appalling notions. The question whether, like Lazarus, one who has once been dead could return alive from the grave. 
The touch of her fingers was cold and slimy, while I feared her smile more than anything in the world. I tried to voice my nightmare horrors to Oliver, but unfortunately, alas, he could not, or would not, understand regarding them merely as the fancies of hysteria. The play was almost finished. Triumphantly, the last scene was completed. He announced his intention of going up to London, with a view to its early production. I heard him with a thrill or unreasoning terror. Let me come with you, I begged. I cannot and will not stay here in this dreadful house alone, he demurred. I shan't be gone more than a few days, a week at the most, he said. Now be sensible, what on earth are you so alarmed about? I could only stammer out something inadequate like, the big lonely house, the moors and the owls and, and Anne Skegg. <laughs> "'What has poor misshapen Anne Skegg done?' he scoffed. "'She can't help her peculiarities. "'The old thing is perfectly harmless, "'though I must admit rather a fearsome-looking object. "'No, no, Francis, you stay here. "'I'll be back in no time, and then we'll clear off, have a holiday. "'Switzerland, the Riviera. "'How about it? "'I feel in my bones the play will create a sensation.' "'He went. In the evening, a few hesitating flakes of snow hovered in the air, which before long thickened into a blizzard, continuing all night. I awoke to find the farmhouse as a beleaguered town, snowdrifts standing halfway up the doors and up to the window ledges, the rooms filled with a strange, unreal light, and the house encompassed about by that unearthly hush which snow inevitably brings. Roads, even hedges had vanished so that there was no means of getting out, and no possibility of holding communication with the outside world. There was only Anne Skegg for company, and the skull grinning eternally in its place on the window sill. The time went by. I became aware of a sense of evil in the farmhouse. An atmosphere so particularly strong in the dismal, mouldy-smelling parlour that I could not only feel it but almost see it, and against which I struggled vainly and ineffectually. Dreams haunted me day and night. I grew perceptibly haggard and wild-eyed, jumping at every sound. Each day I became more terrified of the awful thing that was Anne Skegg. An aura of unspeakable malfeasance hung around her like a black cloud. I became convinced that whatever it was that animated that old wizened troll of a creature, it was some unhallowed thing. The cold sweat would break upon my skin and my bones turned to water whenever she turned upon me, her peculiar, flaccid-looking eyes, in which gleamed a terrible and implacable hate. It was as if she resented my presence as if she wished to be left alone with the ill-omened skull for which she appeared to cherish a ghastly affection. I would see her croon and gibber to it, as if it could understand, and pass her scraggy fingers over its shiny surface, almost with a caressing movement. Impossible and fantastic as it may be, it was as though there existed a secret understanding between them, an affinity. It made my flesh creep to watch. Presently, a horrible fascination took possession of me. I could not tear myself away from looking. I would creep along stealthily to hold my breath in disgust and aversion. And Skegg caught me thus spying upon her one night of bitter cold. She turned suddenly, a cat beside her, and saw me standing there in the doorway. The cat, its fur rising, drew back its lips and snarled hideously and noiselessly. Anne Skegg began to move, and came slowly towards me with that terrible seesaw movement. Her chin mimbling, her head thrust forward, her baleful eyes transfixing mine. The grimmest, most ghastly thing I had ever beheld. I stood like one turned to stone, rooted there as by some strange power, incapable of moving a hand, of uttering a cry. Blood ran cold in my veins, my teeth chattered, my heart stopped beating, and all at once I shrieked. Control slipped from me. As she came slowly on, so I edged round the wall, 
my desperate fingers searched and found a weapon. Screaming wildly, with all my strength I flung the sinister skull full at the oncoming thing and its snarling beast. It fell at their feet with a dull thud and broke into several pieces. And Skag suddenly laughed. <laughs> the vast, loathsome sound. Then, and then only, I realised what I had done. Fear held me in a remorseless grip, while a hundred and one superstitious terrors marshalled themselves before me. Instances of other happenings when the skull had been disturbed, or been made to suffer any indignity shocking enough, rose to my mind. But I, with incredible folly, had reduced it to nothing but a heap of splintered bone. Since it had never been known to fail to punish anyone who mistreated it, I awaited in shuddering anticipation for what was coming. That night I stayed awake, too frightened either to sleep or lie down. But inexplicably enough, there was no repetition of that low, unnerving screaming for which I was waiting. Only an ominous silence. It was now I enacted that scene all over again, saw myself throw the window wide, and with unnatural strength, send the remains of the skull, hurtling through the darkness, to fall into the frozen pond that lay beyond. I heard and shall never cease to hear the small sound of splintering cat ice cut the still air. Yet another night passed, and on the third an indescribably dreadful shrieking and wailing began, as if maddened fiends were howling aloud in pain and derision, and were trying to force a way in from the cold and darkness outside. The terrifying noises, shrieks and groans dwindled, died down, then rose again with tenfold velocity, there was in them this time a malevolence not present upon the first occasion. My heart thump thumping, and I sat up in bed, clutching the clothes, anathematizing the wicked stupidity that had thus released this horror upon my head. Somewhere about midnight, thinking perhaps the rush of cold air might alleviate the fever of terror that alternately chilled and heated my body, I got out of bed to open the window. I shut it with a slam, near to fainting. There, in the blackness, not twenty yards above me, I heard a strange, unholy commotion going on. Wind was racking round the four quarters of the house. Owls screeched, thunder pealed. Trees, opaque shadows, swayed and groaned. The dog far off howled mournfully as if someone were dead. The whole world of night unusually awake and agitated. A waning moon, until then obscured, suddenly showed a wan face behind the clouds as they scurried panic-stricken across the sky, and upon this dark shadows met and parted again with an awful riot of nocturnal clamour, finally sweeping downwards to the ebon surface of the pond, which glimmered a faint silver where the moon glints touched it. They rose with what looked like jagged pieces of bone in their hands, which they let fall again with maleficent laughter, shrieks, and groans. Suddenly, as I watched, one of the shadows that danced around and about the pool and reeled to the blattering wind and the thunder peals, detached itself and rose slowly out of the pond, and, dripping, passed through the door of the farmhouse. With my hair rising upon my scalp, my face bedewed with cold sweat, I recognised it for the fearsome creature I had known as Anne Skeg. I knew now with a hideous certitude that she was dead, had always been dead, that she was the terrible Mally Rye herself, who by some devilish power still walked the earth, drowned but living. Beyond question I knew too that I was there alone to pit my puny strength against the powers of darkness which my action of destroying the skull had released. Those powers which had been in abeyance so long as the sinister relic was neither moved nor harmed now manifested themselves with tenfold force. Nightly, the uncanny shrieks and groans went on, making sleep impossible, abating during the day that droned ceaselessly and monotonously in my ears rising to howl and batter round the house on the approach of the dusk hours. 
Nightly, the unholy play with the broken pieces of the skull was enacted over the dark water of the pool, and never again that old twisted corpse, which was animated by the vengeful spirit of Malirai, rose dripping out of the pond and vanished into the shut door of the farmhouse. Meanwhile, the snow still held, coming in foot after foot of unbroken whiteness. The lines of the farm were obliterated, the roads impassable. There was no sun and no ceasing of the biting chill. With every hour, my soul became more benumbed by fear. The scarlet thread of my brain stretched to breaking point. The climax came suddenly, following on the heels of Oliver's return, the snow having at length melted sufficiently to allow him to cross the moors with great difficulty. Upon seeing him ploughing toilsomely towards the farm, I tottered to the door, overcome with relief. He exclaimed aloud in shocked surprise upon seeing my altered looks, the shadow of myself that I had become. The next moment I crumpled up in a heap at his feet. For God's sake, what is it? What has been happening here while I've been away? He demanded, as once more consciousness returned and I sat up weak and shaking. The tale was soon gasped out. He listened in growing consternation, his face paling in spite of himself. Perhaps it is not too late, even now, he said at length, with an uncontrollable shiver. Pond is not deep. I will fetch a lantern. He went to the door and threw it open. What? Well, what are you going to do? I started up, full of nameless apprehension. Do? Why? Fish the skull up again, of course. We must restore it, bind the pieces together, propitiate the powers of darkness at once. Now, his tongue clove to his mouth. His body stiffened as slowly, step by step, through the door came drifting. The horror that had once been Anne Skegg. There it stood, its face a cadaverous blue, its long fingers cold with the cold of death, its eyes grown empty hollows the rank odour of stagnant water about its clothes, and on its thumb a long black hook, like the hook of a bat. Oliver shrieked aloud in an agony of fear. The thing smiled, the most hideous, diabolical smile, and moved soundlessly on. Upon the floor where its feet passed were patches of green slime. As we retreated, so the thing followed, advancing with a fearful malignity on its skull-like face. Hard-pressed, stark with terror, and the icy cold that radiated from it, I knew now the last scene was to be played to its appointed end. Slowly, foot by foot, we fell before it, Oliver, lamp in hand, his expression one of frozen steadfastness, holding that terrible and basilisk gaze, was the last thing I saw before I sank down insensible for the second time. When I came to, the room was empty, but a rush of cold air was blowing in through the open window. I ran out into the deepening night, crying, Oliver! Oliver! But there was no reply. The yard was deserted and empty. Already that eldritch drone was rising and skirling around the house. Slowly I re-entered and sat in horrible suspense awaiting his return. Several times I went to the window and gazed into the darkness. Once I fancied I heard a faint cry, but attributed it to overwrought nerves. I moved restlessly about the room too frightened either to stay in that haunted house, or brave the unknown perils without. At last, finding the suspense unendurable and clutching at all the remnants of my courage, I went out in search of him. Wind, like water, swept cold and black. Lightning, although it was midwinter, cut the inky darkness of the heavens. The night was full of sound. Thunder peal upon thunder peal rumbled and rolled along the tours. The air was close and unnaturally oppressive. I called repeatedly, with a sense of impending calamity. Oliver! Oh, Oliver, answer me! Answer me! 
But no sound of a replying voice came to my straining ears. I went on, fearful, stumbling. And then there came, borne on the wind, a piercing cry, as if someone were in deadly danger. Oliver! Oliver! I cried again and again, and then I saw, I saw a sight that has seared itself indelibly upon my eyeballs. In the eerie light of the hurricane lamp that lay fallen on its side on the snowy brink of the pond, the great curtain of the night beyond, I saw Oliver beaten back till he stood in its very water, still keeping at bay that thing of ghastly horror. My heart hammered against my ribs. My breath came and went in great gasps as I stood there staring. So fearful was the sight, so dire my foreboding. In the waving, fluttering light of the lamp, I saw with dread the thing, advancing and receding, but always coming nearer, draw close with deadly purpose, one gaunt arm outstretched. I saw Oliver's white face thrown back, his eyes almost starting out of his head with fear and loathing, staring into the eye holes where hers had been. Finally, with a despairing gesture, he threw up his arms, covered his eyes, shrieked out, Drown, witch, fiend, whatever you are, in the name of the devil, drown! <sighs> On a sudden there sprang up a moaning gust of wind. The eldritch girling rose to a howl. The heavens opened. There came a flash of lightning, intense, blue. I saw the horror shiver, bend and sink down. The black water of the pool quiver, then... Even as I looked above his head, hovered something foul, something unspeakably awful, with vast, leathery bat pinions, hooked feet. Even as a cry of terror broke from me, struggling helplessly and unavailingly, he was enveloped in the shadow of the dark wings, caught up, and finally disappeared from sight into the black and howling vault above. With that, thunder crashed peal upon peal. There was a sound as of the world wailing in anguish, a sound as of demonic laughter, triumphant, utterly vile. Something shrieked, shrieked, and shrieked again above the clangor. I heard it, hear it still. Then blindly, I turned, and ran on and on, mile upon mile, over the snowbound moors. Notice having been brought to the doctor of an out-of-the-way village of a woman seen wandering about whose actions and strange appearance excited the suspicions of the villagers. I was certified and confined to an asylum as hopelessly mad. There are people who think I am still, are afraid to let me out after having spent thirty years of my life behind high, imprisoning walls. Oliver, he was found, inexplicably burnt, and almost unrecognisable, his face scarred, and scarred again as with great claws. <laughs> well, goodbye, goodbye if you must go. Thank you for coming to see an old woman like me. I'm quite sane, quite normal, only I behave strangely if I see a bat. I've forgotten why now. It's all going again. Today's story was Unburied Bane by N. Dennett. It was read by Jasper Lestrange. If you enjoy the show, why not become a patron on Patreon and gain access to exclusive content? It's the surest way to help me keep creating. You can also buy me a coffee, like, subscribe, comment, share, follow on social media, and read the description for more information about the show and how you can engage with it. Until next time, sweet dreams. Come in.
he said. Come into the light. Join me on Patreon for stories like this. Aye, he replied. The oldest show on earth. All about a murder and a hanging. It's queer how folks like a murder, even if it's only old Punch knocking Judy's brains out with his stick. And stories like this. Beyond this are the private apartments and I ask you all to remove your shoes. Then she smiled a little and added, or other footwear. And this. As I was getting up speed, I heard the pad of feet and a snarling behind me. The next moment, the heavy bulk of a big animal caught me broadside on and nearly unseated me. Show your support for the channel and join me on Patreon. Those who would prefer not to do so may sit on the seats and wait here. Read the video description for more information.